So we're, we're not done worshiping just yet. We, we've titled this night, Royal Etiquette in the Presence of the King. So we're gonna be dealing a little bit with the topic of how to conduct ourselves in the presence of the King. You can get comfortable if you'd like. I'm gonna talk for about five minutes and then another 10, and then we're gonna go into worship just so you know where we're headed. If you'd like to stand, you can stand. If you'd like to sit, you can sit. Royal etiquette. God is in this place, and so since we are in this place as well, how do we behave in the presence of the king? But see, etiquette is not a word that we use in everyday life. Etiquette is not a word that we typically describe. In fact, when I first heard the word etiquette, I immediately thought about um, like a school of conduct that people are sent to to learn not to put their elbows on tables and to use the right forks when they go to fancy dinners. Etiquette can easily become a word that creates distance because it seems formal, but etiquette is simply a set of standards. It's a set of practices that we use when we do a certain thing. And so we're talking about royal etiquette. We believe we're worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, so he deserves a certain level of honor. And so whenever we come into his presence, how do we interact with a holy God? How do we interact in God's presence? You could immediately go to uh, elbows on the table and forks. We could immediately go to practices that we use, expressions of worship. We could dive into that. We could talk about lifting our hands or we could talk about singing loudly or we could talk about dancing and bowing. We could do all of those types of things. Those are expressions of worship, but by themselves, they do not define worship. If we focus too much on the expressions, then we might find ourselves in a debate. You may have been here before a debate with a person about how much dancing is the appropriate amount, how much lifting of hands is okay, how loud is too loud to sing. We fall really easily into the expressions of worship, but royal etiquette levels the playing field. Royal etiquette takes us into reverence when we've been too casual with God. Because to be too casual with a holy God demeans and discredits his holiness. It removes the holy fear that he commands us to have. And so we could become too casual, but on the opposite end, we could become too rigid. We could think that God is unapproachable and that we shouldn't even try to approach him. But that keeps God at arm's length and doesn't allow our God-given emotions to process pieces of who he is. So we have to find the balance, the royal etiquette. We can't stand there like statues when we realize all God's done for us and that when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says the veil in the most holy place was torn and picture God standing in the middle of the tear, welcoming us in. Royal etiquette, how do we behave in the presence of the king? Can you sense his presence in this room? He's here. And how tragic of us to relegate worship to a surface level description and a surface level thing in our lives that we come and we encounter a God that's been chasing us in our sin and chasing us when we were too broken to feel him and healing us just enough to take another step and we thought we were strong enough to keep going. That God is in this place and we can turn around and leave and have never encountered him, have never communed with him. Pastor Robert stood right here this weekend and preached that you can sing a song and not worship. You can lift your hands and not worship. You can come into this place and your heart be far from God. And so tonight, the goal is that we would draw in because there's a deeper realm of spiritual reality that God is calling us to live our everyday lives in. It's not just supposed to be a Tuesday night thing once a month or a campus night thing, or even a thing that happens when we listen to music. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but you've heard this before. Worship has very little to do with music. It has very little to do with one night. Even further into that point, when we come together to worship God like this, it's amazing. There's something about the corporate worship that is so powerful, but this was never intended to take the place of you and I having consistent, open-hearted, wholehearted, personal worship, personal moments with God. 
I came with a word to challenge you and I tried so hard to talk myself and the Lord out of it, but I just feel like for some of us, we have to move beyond the baby milk and into the meat of this relationship with God. You don't need a worship leader to lead you into worship. And I'm a worship leader. I would love to be out of a job because no one even needs me anymore. Because all of a sudden, the children of God wake up and say, I just need to enter into my Father's presence. I just need to inwardly turn my heart to him and realize he's closer than my breath. But if we're not careful, we can very easily have a tragic surface level relationship with worship. We can so easily create a hierarchy of worship leaders. Can we be real? We can create our favorite playlist. We can come in and if we don't sing the right songs, we're not worshiping. But then whenever that one song comes on that we really love, it's like immediately, you know? It's like Reckless Love a year ago. Bam, bam. It's like all we needed to know was that we were going into that. But listen, here's the truth. As soon as our preference creeps into our worship, so does our pride. And as soon as we make these moments more about us than we do about God, we lose the whole purpose from the get-go. This was never intended to be about what you and I favor, what you and I want, what you and I desire. This is about laying down whoever we are in that exact moment to a holy God that's willing to change and accept us. To change us in grace and truth and love. To walk with us. Not to demand us to be different immediately, but to give him our hearts. Worship is a position of the heart. As I was studying this today, I felt like God dropped a phrase in my heart about worship, this simple definition of what worship is, and hopefully you can remember this. I feel like the Lord told me that worship is a shortcut back home. That no matter how far you've wandered, you ever wonder how in 20 minutes we can feel clean again? As soon as we're in his presence, it's gone. We're home. We're home. Falling into his arms feels like coming home. Where we were always intended to be. So tonight, we're going to position our heart. We're going to talk about three functions of worship. And then I'm going to have you stand back up in just a few minutes. And we're going to actually put these functions of worship into practice. We're going to actually grow tonight in our ability and in our inclination of our hearts to worship God. So we're gonna talk about the first one, which is that the first function of worship. Worship shifts our perspective. Worship shifts our perspective. It's easy for us to get so focused on the things we see in our everyday lives, but worship shifts our perspective. Listen to this, Psalm 8, three through four says, David writes, when I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man, that you look after him? God, when I look at the, the grandeur of creation, when I see all that you've done, in those days they could look up at the sky and the mountains and see all that God had done, the vastness of who he is. Today in 2019, we can look at that and we can also look within on a molecular level and see the symmetry in the cells, the beauty of God's design. We have not even scratched the surface of who God is. When we enter into worship, it helps us remember how big, how able, how willing, how strong our God is. It helps us put into perspective these very temporary struggles that we go through that so easily consume our entire lives. That if we don't get this promotion, this job, if this one thing doesn't happen, if she doesn't respond to me, if he doesn't want me, my life is over. And we get into this whole tailspin and then we come into worship and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm home, I remember. Okay, okay. There's a function of worship that shifts our perspective. Job chapter 26 verse 14 probably the favorite scripture of mine that we're gonna talk about tonight. It says this, these are but the fringes of his ways. How faint is the word that we hear of him? Who can understand his mighty thunder? Put into perspective that in all of humanity from Adam to you, 
all of humanity's greatest effort to understand God has gotten to the fringes of who he is. There is a depth that we know not of, my friends. There is a whole other reality over the top of your reality and mine. And God is asking us to bring our reality to him in moments like this of worship so that he can superimpose his reality over yours and give you spiritual eyes to see what is not there in the natural, but will be by the grace of God, like strength and peace and joy and that substance that you need to carry on through the next day. It might look like words in a conversation. It might look like a calmness in a chaotic situation. But listen, when you and I put all our focus on what we're going through, we literally are, if you could just get this image with me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an, uh, a visual person, so if you could just go with me here. When you and I focus all that we have on whatever, on whatever we're going through, what happens is that thing starts to come from being in front of us to starting to consume our lives. Do you, do you uh, resonate with this? Like you put focus on something and all of a sudden it's all you can see. It's why when you decide you wanna get a certain car, they're all over the place on the highway all of a sudden. Your, your eye is trained to magnify what you focus on. And so whenever you focus on what you're going through, it magnifies itself and it starts to come over you like a canopy. And so we fall when we focus on the stresses and the what ifs and all the things that could go wrong and all the places we thought we would be by now at 25 or 28 or however old we are. 29 is the cutoff, right? If you're 30, get out. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Whatever place of life you're in right now, we all have struggles. We all have daily things of, I wish this would just happen. I'm just kind of waiting on this next move. And when I get to this next move, I'll feel more satisfied. Whatever it is, whatever we're clawing after, it gets magnified and comes over us like a canopy. And then we wonder why we feel depressed, which just means to be pressed down upon. We wonder why we deal with anxiety and we, we can't feel like we're in open spaces. We feel claustrophobic in the spirit because we've magnified something that's come up over us. But listen, the same principle works in every direction. As soon as you put your focus on the kingdom of God, the Bible says, all these things that you've been wanting and thinking you need, that the Father, Jesus said, knows what you need before you even ask him for it. Those things, the kingdom of God starts to come over you. And when the kingdom of God, like a canopy, comes over your life, all of the principles, all of the laws, all of the rules that apply in the kingdom, which is on God's grace and according to his riches in glory, comes over your life and all of a sudden your perspective shifts when you come under the kingdom. So what are you focusing on tonight? We all brought things in. We all brought heavinesses in. We all brought disappointments in. We all did, and they hurt, and they should, because the depth of pain reveals the depth God's willing to go to heal. So as you feel that pain, instead of running from it, you experience a newness about God. You see a facet of him that he's not embarrassed because you feel broken. He's not embarrassed because you're not where you thought you would be. You're exactly where he knew you would be. And he's speaking truth and life over you tonight. Isaiah 55, eight through nine says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we're gonna go back into a song of worship in just a second. In fact, I'm gonna invite you to stand right now so we can prepare ourselves for that. Listen, if you wanna come down to the front, if you wanna spread out, if you want to do whatever you need to do, we want you to get into a place where you can actually press in. That's the whole point. We wanna talk about these things and then we wanna put them into action. So worship, first and foremost, shifts our perspective. It helps us to put our focus, our attention on God and on who he is even as we see all the things we're go that are going on in our own lives, we see who God is and magnifies the kingdom over our hearts. So Lord, as we 
worship you. As we put our eyes and our attention on you, God, we pray right now that you would open our perspective to see that same problem in a new way tonight, Lord. We pray we would see that thing standing in front of us, that mountain that won't seem to move. We pray right now, we speak to the mountain in faith, and we say, God, you are greater, you are bigger, you are the creator of all creation, you are the God that stands alone, you are holy, you are righteous, you are all powerful, you are all present, you are all knowing. God, we lift up your name, we glorify you with our hearts inwardly now, we turn our hearts and our attention to you. We're not focusing on who's around us. We're not focusing on anything other than you, Lord. So shift our perspective. Lord, I pray right now for mental capacities to increase in this place tonight, that understanding would increase tonight, that revelation would drop from heaven into open hearts and willing souls. In the name of Jesus, we worship you. Come on, let's worship and let's press in. of creation there at the start for the beginning of Oh. 
so worship shifts our perspective and we see God in a new way, the way he was always intended to be seen, which is higher than all, greater than all, and capable of everything we need him to be. So worship shifts our perspective. Worship is also a weapon. Worship is a weapon. In fact, 2 Corinthians 10, three through five, it's a familiar verse. It says, for although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Some of y'all have already gotten ahead of us and you're already in warfare. And it's okay because it's a natural progression. As soon as we see God for who he is, we start to believe that he can do what he said he'll do. And a righteousness on the inside of us says, I wanna take what's mine. I wanna step into the full calling of what God has won for me and is my birthright as his child. Worship is a weapon. Notice that it says the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, even, if, even though we live in the flesh. The reality is that when you and I get into battle, so many times our natural response, which is fight or flight, kicks in. Some of us choose to stand and fight. And if you're like me, that's where we're at. Most of the time, I fancy myself a fighter, and I think that I'm gonna stand and be like, bring it on then, you know? <laughs> From Louisiana, and so I'm a little bit scrappy, and so I'm ready for whatever, at whatever time. You just call me. I'm the guy you want in a brawl. Just, just saying. I'm the guy jumping off the balcony going, Yaka! like whatever. <laughs> like, I'm the crazy dude. That's what I am. Okay, I accept that. But whenever I get into a spiritual warfare, that doesn't work anymore. And that desire, that need to fight, that need to step in becomes very counterproductive. Because when I step into a spiritual fight with physical weapons, it seems like I'm making no progress. And all of a sudden, those same tried and true methods that I've tried my entire life that have maybe gotten somewhere with other people don't work whenever the enemy comes at me. Like the Bible says like a flood whenever I'm swept over with temptation or swept over with darkness or swept over with just apathy. Whatever it is that you're walking through, questions, doubts, whatever it is, it's a spiritual battle. We need to be awakened to the fact that we're fighting a spiritual battle. This says our war is not of the flesh. It's of the spirit. Then it goes on to say that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. Some of us tonight need to understand our place in the battle. See, some of us have been fighting and struggling and we're to the point where we're ready to give up because we're seeing no progress made. And we think that because I'm putting forth effort and not seeing return, I need to quit. I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'll never overcome this. This will be my struggle forever. This is always gonna be on me. This is always gonna be over me. I guess this is my lot in life. And so we go from being in a fighting stance, because I told you I'm a fighter, but in the fight of my life, which unrolled and unraveled over the last few years, this fighter started to run because I couldn't do it. I could not, I had no weapon for anxiety. I had no weapon for depression. I had no weapon for suicidal thoughts. I had no weapon for wanting to give up. I had no weapon except fetal position and begging God to make it go away. What do you do in those moments? I know that's the extreme, but what do you do whenever a friend offers you an opportunity to just lessen your convictions a little bit, to toe the line? What do you do whenever a holy walk with God is challenged by an opportunity? What do you do in the battles that you face? 
Just the same way we all came in with a heaviness, we all come in in, in a certain battle at a certain point in our lives. But worship is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. In fact, I, these lyrics kind of just dropped in my mind a few months ago. I was walking in those doors right there, actually. It might have been for, a, I think it was for a one night, uh, late last year. And I walked in, and just all of a sudden, this, this line popped in my head. I'm going into battle swinging songs like a sword. And I was like, oh, man, yeah. Yeah, Lord, what's the rest? What's the rest? <laughs> Nothing. I'll work on it. We'll come back. We'll circle back on that. But I think that might have been enough that we go into battle swinging songs like a sword. Look at this, in 2 Chronicles 20, starts in verse 15. In fact, you know what? Let me just summarize it for you just for time's sake. There's a king named Jehoshaphat, and he's being threatened by this enormous attack of the literal multiple enemies. There's multiple armies coming against him, and they're gonna outnumber his men in a ridiculous way. There's no way that they're gonna get out of this. So Jehoshaphat hears news of what's gonna happen, Immediately, he seeks the Lord, as most of us do when we get into a crisis situation. The Lord says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast number of your enemies, for this battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. You will see them coming up the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the valley facing the wilderness of Jeruel. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. For most of us tonight, for all of us tonight, whoever has been in this room, whoever's in this room, and, and you've been swinging weapons, or you've been running and numbing yourself with alcohol and relationships and and everything else that just numbs us, gives us an instant gratification and then instant regret. Whatever it is that you come in here with tonight, you understand that our wiring forces us to go to some sort of weapon, some sort of mechanism for survival. Whether it be fighting by just trying to try harder, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I swore I wouldn't do it. I'm never gonna do that again. Oh, I'm never going to do it again. And then a week later, okay, now I'm never going to do it again. <clears throat> you can't work yourself out of this one because you weren't designed to. Because if you and I could deliver ourselves from our own issues, we would have no need of a savior. We would never know God as our defender. We would never know God as our protector. We would never know God as our provider if you and I could do it on our own. And so God put in our hard wiring a need for him. And he also put in our hard wiring a will to choose. For some of us, we'll feel freedom as soon as we lay down the weapons of the flesh, as soon as we lay down what we've been swinging and we pick up worship as a weapon. That's exactly what Jehoshaphat did. He, in fact, called a fast in the land and He's like, everybody better pray right now. <laughs> he was just real. I, I just imagine people in the Bible talking like that. I think we overanalyze a lot. They were normal people, you know what I'm saying? People would have come to him and be like, Joe's fat, bunch of dudes about to kill all of us. And he'd have been like, Lord? <laughs> you see, therefore, beyond me, all these armies. No, I don't know. He's a normal guy. And I relate to that because he would have been very afraid. He would have felt very overwhelmed. He would have felt like this maybe was it. And some of us feel that way tonight. Some of you might feel that way tonight. That this struggle that you're in, I hear you, Zach, yeah, that's great. Yeah, if my girlfriend breaks up with me, I'll remember this, but right now, I'm in the fight of my life. And I don't know that that applies. Jehoshaphat begs to differ because he was faced with a life-threatening situation and he sought God. He got a word from God, and basically all God said was, I'll be there. You show up and see. So for you tonight, 
I wanna speak into whatever you're walking to when you turn around and go out these doors and return to your normal, regularly scheduled programming called your life. God says, I'll be there. You show up and see the deliverance of the Lord. And so Jehoshaphat with his army, his whole crew, they line up and they start walking out the next morning. Can you imagine Jehoshaphat trying to put on a strong face? I mean, I'm sure he had faith, but at the same time, he's like, dear God, please let this work. He looks to his right and he sees warriors with spears, looks to his left and he sees dudes with swords and shields and he gets a little bit of comfort because he's like, all right, well, I'm not going into this by myself. So look around. You've got warriors with spiritual weapons all around you. You're not going into this by yourself. And then Jehoshaphat had this revelation, this epiphany hit him and he said, wait, wait. Turned around to the people. Which one of y'all can sing? Come to the front. No, I heard you sing. Come over here. Come up. Come on. Come on. Bring them all. And in front of the warriors, he placed worshipers. And he said, now we can go. And they went up to the mountain singing, singing and worshiping God. Faced with a life-threatening situation. They're singing. The enemy hears them in the valley and they're like, y'all hear that? What is that? Is that singing? You ever heard somebody like sing with like crazy eyes? Like, <laughs> that's what I picture. Like Jehoshaphat's just messing with him at this point because he's got full faith. God's given him like the gift of faith. He's like, no, oh, y'all joker's about to die. <laughs> and he's like singing at him like, praise God from whom all bless. <laughs> like just messing with him. The enemy freaks out. God literally makes the enemy turn on themselves. And what was meant for Jehoshaphat and the army's death actually became a huge blessing because they plundered the entire three armies and didn't have to fight one time for it. They only had to show up and see the salvation that the Lord was gonna give to them. So listen to this. There is a place and a time in your life where you will feel broken. It's a part of humanity. God allows that to come into our hearts so that we can know him on a deep and intimate level. On the level to which you're willing to open your heart and be vulnerable to God is the level to which you'll know him. And so sometimes God, all the time, God works through the things that we go through. And I had this image in my mind of me and you literally on the ground, I'm just gonna do it on the ground because we go in life and we're walking and everything's fine and then we get blindsided with something or we get some unexpected thing and it brings us to our knees. Like a report that an army's coming against Jehoshaphat. And we have this response of worship. Okay, Lord, I'm gonna believe you, Lord. You're good. You're good, Lord. You have my worship and we lift up worship to him. But how many of you know the enemy doesn't stop when we start worshiping? That he still can come and he still can force us to our knees and he just pokes us and prods us for no reason just because he's evil. And he comes in with more attacks and maybe even the forces of the enemy get you into a place where you find yourself on your face. And I had this image of myself on my face, on the ground with the enemy over me and he's pushing my face into the dirt and he's gloating because he thinks he's won and I'm singing, and I'm worshiping. In the midst of whatever darkness, in the midst of whatever pain, there is a weapon that God has given to you and me that the enemy can't steal. And all of a sudden, when he's smiling, gloating over us, pushing our faces into the dirt, that smile fades pretty quickly when he hears the sound of the children of God calling on legions of angels to come and wipe out the enemy. And all we had to do was show up and see. Worship is a weapon. So we're gonna go back into another song in a moment, and I want us to do some warfare tonight. Listen, 
the, the level to which you're willing to open up your heart and be vulnerable to God, I'm not talking about surface level interaction with him. I'm not saying, God, here's my prayer list. The Bible doesn't say that David was a man after God's blessing. It says man, David was a man after God's heart. He wasn't seeking God to do something. He was just seeking to get into his presence because he knew that in that place, the warrior of all warriors would take on his fight for him. Royal etiquette. Can you imagine how foolish we must look sometimes in the presence of an undefeated warrior champion of the universe and we're trying to swing our own sword when all we need to do is step to the side and say, I'm just gonna worship. God, you're worthy. I'm gonna trust you. The only reason... The only reason you would not worship God tonight in the midst of your trial is because you think that you taking a break from fighting is going to affect your future in a negative way. But if you would take a step back from your own battle and you would lean in to worship tonight, you would walk out of this place understanding that the battle is over. That Satan cannot steal your worship, but you can give it to him. So tonight let's make the declaration that we're not gonna do that. Never. You will never have our praise. God, you alone will have our praise. God, we lift up our faith to you. We lift up our song to you, Lord. We lift up praise. Come on, you don't need a worship leader. Just lift up your own song in this place. God, this is how we fight. We are surrendered to you, Lord. You alone, God, you are worthy to be praised. God, we trust you with our future. We trust you with our career. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our callings. We trust you, Lord. We're laying down every attempt on our own hands, Lord, to make something happen. We trust that you'll be there. We will show up and we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You will never abandon us. You have not left us. You have not forsaken us. You've prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies and our cup runs over. Lord, you are good and you never change. You are worthy to be praised, God. Come on, fight in the spirit. Let's worship together.
So worship shifts our perspective. Worship is a weapon. And in these moments in God's presence, as we lean into the intimacy that he offers to us, we find out that worship is a healing experience. That there's healing available tonight for you and for me. There's healing available tonight. Find hope even in that truth. There's healing available tonight, right now. Right now. Psalm 107, 19 through 21 says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He sent his word and healed them. He rescued them from the pit. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Notice they didn't have to do anything to get themselves right before they came. They were in it. In it. Whatever it is. If you're in something tonight, the only thing that's stopping that breakthrough you've been wanting, crying out for, is your worship. Worship opens the door for God to move. You know why? Because worship pulls your heart close to his. And just because of the proximity of the Father, things have to change. Things are restored into their original intent and original design. Before you and I walk through experiences that marred our outlook on life, before we got jaded, before we got cynical, before we got bitter, That's why Jesus says you've got to come like a child, pure. Not influenced by what we have experienced or believed in a negative way, but full of wonder and possibility of what God could do. If you truly believe that God is who he says he is, the creator of all creation, if you truly believe that worship is a weapon and that in the middle of the fight, your job is to worship, then You must believe that as you worship, God comes in and heals you. But this interesting thing happens because God's given each of us self-awareness. He's given us the ability to look within our hearts and on some level diagnose what's going on. On some level to understand with his supervision and revelation, he gives us truth about what we've been believing. And that truth shows us why we're stuck in that place that we are. See, because some of our parents walked out on us, we have attributed that and we've said, okay, people are always going to fail me. That was me. People are always gonna let me down. They're gonna disappoint me. So I'm going to keep distance between myself and people so I don't get hurt anymore. But I'm missing out on relationship. I'm missing out on intimacy with people. I'm missing out on intimacy with God because ultimately, whatever I believe about humanity, I project onto God as well. If I believe that he's going to leave me, if I believe that he on some level doesn't accept me, if I believe that I'm interchangeable in his eyes, I miss the point completely. And that's not Zach talking, that's the wound talking. That's that place of pain talking. And so just For a moment, I'm going to ask you to go to that place. Go to it, whatever it is. Don't let fear overwhelm you. To revisit that place will not trigger an anxiety attack. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. To go back to that place will not cause you to panic. It will not cause you to be embarrassed. Whatever you've walked through and you've been ignoring, go back there now for a purpose. Because God wants to restore and cover and heal the places that you've walked past because you thought ignorance and ignoring them would make them go away. Time does not heal all wounds. Our Father does. And so any amount of time can have passed and there can still be wounds there. So Holy Spirit, right now, I pray you would open up our eyes to see a place where we've believed a lie, to see a place where we've been wounded, Lord,
Perfect love casts out all fear. Lord, I pray in these moments you would show us what lies we've believed that we needed to perform, that we needed to get it together, that we needed to create a future, that we deserved what happened, that people will always fail us, that you wouldn't accept us. Even if we don't have language for that, Lord, our actions have shown that we want to keep you at arm's length. And so, Lord, right now we repent of that. Go ahead and repent of that. And right now, Holy Spirit, as we worship you, I pray, Lord, that your anointing would come like a healing balm top of our heads now, Jesus. You would transform our minds. We are not broken. We are not less than. We are not devalued. We are not damaged goods. Lord, let it pour over our eyes. We see what you see, Lord. The potential you placed in our DNA from the beginning of time. Before the foundations of the world, you knew us, Lord. Touch our mouths. Father, we repent of every time we've agreed with a lie, every time we've agreed, Lord, with the word the enemy spoke that you weren't speaking. Lord, let your healing flow into our hearts, into the depths of our emotions, Lord. Heal us. You are able. You are gentle. You're kind. And your loving patience leads us to repentance. Down into our souls, Lord. Restore our souls. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, even death, I fear no danger. For you are with me. Your rod and staff Comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Lord, for anyone in this place that's believed their past was going to pursue them for the rest of their life, that the things they've done have now disqualified them from a future with you, Lord, I declare right now that only goodness and faithful love will pursue them, that their past is completely covered in the blood of Jesus. God, right now we stand in your blood. We have come under the flow of the mercy seat. We acknowledge that you are God. We acknowledge that it is your grace that gives us breath. Lord, in battlegrounds, we worship. We trust you completely. And God, we come to you. Even if we come with a limp, we come to you. Even if we come with questions, we come to you. Even if we come with a heart that's been abused, we come to you. We come to you with complications because man makes things complicated, but Lord, you make them simple. You say, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and 
let me give you rest. So Lord, now we're in the green pastures in an open field. Our soul is being restored. Our mind, our will, our emotions. We submit the pain to you, Lord. We lay it at your feet. And as we lift our chin, as we lift our head to look into the eyes of our Father, we see you smiling over us. There's no disappointment. There's no judgment. We're covered in your blood. And there's nothing left to do. Except from the depths of our soul to say thank you. From the depths of our heart to give you praise. You have done what we could never do. You traded your life. You died for our sin. You were punished because of our decisions. And you look at us with love. So Lord, in humility, we acknowledge our need for you. Unapologetically, we bring you everything we are. just to spend time with our Father. Lord, I pray in these moments you would do ministry. I pray you would heal broken hearts. I pray you would speak life. I pray that you would restore souls. Let this be a holy moment with you. A healing experience in Jesus' name.